and welcome you to the midweek Bible study of the Gadsden Church of Christ. This is August 5th, uh, 2020, and we're gathered here, here again uh, on this Wednesday evening in my office here at the church building as we will be continuing our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, in just a few minutes as we get into our um, lesson. Uh, I, I would like to mention, uh, I've not mentioned this before, and I should have, uh, since we're not able to, to be together and we're not able to have discussion as we normally would have on our in our auditorium on Wednesday evenings, I would encourage you, if you have any, any questions or, or comments, uh, that you can submit those uh, to me and uh, I would be glad to address uh, any questions that I can and try to clear up any uh, confusion that might be left from the things that we talk about. So if you have any questions or if there's just something that you uh, don't understand, then I would encourage you to send those questions or concerns uh, to me, and then I will try to address those in the future. You can send those to me via Facebook Messenger. You can send me a private message on Facebook. You can text me. Uh, you're welcome to call me or to email me. My cell phone number is 256-504-6912. Uh, so just do your best to reach out to me and to get any questions that you might have uh, to me. In that regard, a couple of weeks ago, I received a a comment. It wasn't really a question, but it was a comment via uh, Facebook Messenger, and it was after we had been looking in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, the question or comment was, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, the second part of that statement was or is unclear to me. Uh, I responded to that at the time, but I thought that it, others may have the same thought or same concern, so I thought that I would share that uh, answer uh, that I gave, uh, and I'll share that this evening, and then I, again, would encourage you to submit any, any questions or thoughts that you might have. Uh, first of all, we need to remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, let me just uh, read that um, it says but he who is spiritual judges all things yet he himself is rightly judged by no one so the concern that the individual had that uh, sent this to me was the second part of the verse that says yet he himself is rightly judged by no one I would encourage us to remember the context of the passage uh, that is there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and the context is there is a, a, a clear contrast and or comparison being made uh, between the spiritual person and the natural person. Uh, the natural person uh, is one that does not have God's wisdom. Look at verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And so in the passage there is uh, we talked a lot about foolishness and wisdom. Uh, what was foolish? It, even things that are wise to other people seem foolish to the natural man, uh, the man that is not, or the person that is not led by uh, the Spirit of God through a knowledge of His Word. And then here, the word that is translated as judged or judges or uh, appraises uh, is from a group, uh, a Greek uh, root word that in this context 
suggest the idea of investigating or examining. So Paul seems to be saying that a spiritual person given the ability to see and understand spiritual things uh, can thereby examine everything. That is meaning that a spiritual, that spiritual people can assess both things of the material wor world known as human wisdom or known by uh, human uh, wisdom uh, and the spiritual things they can discern only known with the help of God's spirit. And likewise, and for the same reason, uh, the spiritual person cannot be correctly examined or investigated by those who do not have the help uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Non-believers or even the spiritually immature, which may very well be who is being talked about in this passage, are not able to truly see the spiritual part of that person. Again, uh, I would mention there in verse, chapter 2 and verse 14. And then I would like for you to consider the rendering of this verse from the easy to read version. I don't often use the, really ever use the easy to read version in my uh, teaching. But I thought here the rendering of the easy to read version of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15 may help uh, to clear up the confusion that exists. It says, we who have the Spirit are able to make judgments about all things. But anyone without the Spirit is not able to make proper judgments about us. In other words, if they don't have the Spirit, they can't make judgments about the folks that do have the Spirit and the wisdom that comes along with the knowledge of God's Word that's given through uh, the Holy Spirit. And then finally, I would say, I, I think the phrase, uh, that final phrase, he himself is rightly judged by no one, is really saying that a natural man, that is one lacking God's wisdom, is not capable of judging things pertaining to the spirit. And that includes people. If people are spiritual, then someone that doesn't have any spiritual knowledge or any spiritual wisdom cannot judge that spiritual person. So I believe that gives maybe a little bit of explanation in regard to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15 and hopefully clears that up for any questions that may exist. Again, um, I should have mentioned it earlier, and I'm sorry that I didn't, but please feel free to submit uh, questions or comments uh, to me, and I'll be glad to consider those, and if at all possible, I will address them uh, the next time that we have a uh, class together. So, we're into chapter 3, verses um, 16 and 17. Uh, in the New Testament... Uh, there are several things that the Lord's church is pictured as. And here in this passage, the Lord's church is pictured or depicted as the temple of God. This passage, and, and, and I'll admit up front, I'm going to look at this passage probably in a different way than you've ever looked at it because we've always looked at this passage in pertaining to an individual uh, being the temple of God. But uh, I, I'm not so sure from the passage that's what's being referred to. Uh, so I want to look at it in a little different way than perhaps we have uh, looked at it before. Uh, but there, uh, verse 16 of chapter 3, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? 
and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Again, Scripture often depicts, or at times depicts, uh, the Lord's church as being a temple of God. And I believe this is one of those places. Look back in chapter, uh, earlier in chapter 3, in verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Elsewhere in, in the writings of Paul, he makes reference to the church as being the temple of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 referring to the holy temple of the Lord. Peter makes reference of depicting the Lord's church as a temple of God. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. But really, the, whether, whether we view this, these two verses as talking about us as individuals being the temple of God, which I think is relevant, or if we view it as we as individuals being part of the temple of God, being the church, and I, I believe in the context that might well be what is being referred to, but regardless of how we look at what that is referring to, the same principles uh, would apply, but I'm going to uh, address it from the possibilities that uh, are depicted in verse 17. And that is, we read there of two, two terrible uh, possibilities uh, that exist. First of all, one can be guilty of defiling or destroying the temple of God. Regardless of what that temple is, we've mentioned, uh, whether you view it as being your body or whether you view it as being the church, the real key is that we can be guilty of defiling the temple of God. And the second terrible possibility is that God will destroy those who defile or destroy um, his temple. Here the words defile and destroy both come from the same Greek word. And that word means to waste or to pine away, to corrupt uh, or to destroy, uh, as we could find in the complete word study dictionary. Um, Barnes says the Greek word is the same in both parts of the sentence. If any man destroy the temple of God, God will destroy him. And so two, two very um, ugly, uh, terrible possibilities are presented in um, these verses. And so I believe that the words in our text would naturally raise two questions. In other words, if, if it's a possibility for someone to um, be guilty of defiling or destroying the temple of God, then I believe a, a very relevant question and the first question that I would want to know is how might that happen? If I could be guilty of destroying the temple of God and if that defilement or destroying leads to my being destroyed, then I should be interested in how that could happen. So how might one destroy the temple of God? It's not really presented in this passage, but we can look in other places and draw some conclusions uh, and first of all, we could conclude that we might destroy the temple of God through religious strife. 
We've already talked quite a bit in the book of 1 Corinthians about the strife that existed at Corinth. Go back to chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, uh, and read about the strife and the, uh, the division um, that existed because of the strife that was present. Uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we see that that strife uh, prevented many members from receiving spiritual meat. Um, verse 1 and 2, chapter 3, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. And why were they not able? Well, we have to look back at what had been said previously. It was because of the strife that existed. The, the division that was taking place at the church in Corinth. And, and no doubt it was defiling. It was destroying the temple of God there. That being the Lord's church. In chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 leads us to, to see that it, it left those members in a state of carnality. Those that were, were buying into the division and a part of the division and the strife that, that existed, that existed and led, it, it existed because of carnality. Uh, and it even led them further into their carnal ways. We also see that pa Paul warned the churches of Galatia of the dangers of strife uh, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15. Where religious strife exists, the temple of God is being destroyed. And, and I believe we need to gather that from this passage. How might one destroy the temple of God? First of all, through religious strife. Secondly, I would say, uh, through destructive doctrines. Throughout the New Testament, especially as we get in really to a lot of Peter's writings, he warned of the destructive influence of false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse 1. Uh, going on there in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, um, the destructive uh, influence of false teachers uh, caused many Christians uh, to follow in their destructive ways. Paul warned uh, of those who are leading many astray in Acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 30. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, also expressly warns of such an apostasy uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. So where false teaching occurs, uh, the temple of God is being destroyed. So, the temple of God, the church of our Lord, can be destroyed through um, strife. Um, and the temple, the church, can be destroyed through destructive doctrines. And thirdly, I would mention that the temple of God can be defiled or destroyed through slothful service. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9 tells us that the slothful person is a brother to one who is a great destroyer. Really making the same point that Paul is making. Uh, slothful servant is a destroyer and is akin to one. When it comes to religious service, um, then the the devastating effect of this slothful service is, is vividly illustrated by Solomon in the book of 
Proverbs uh, chapter 24, verses 30 through uh, 34. Let me just turn there. Proverbs 24. Verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So your poverty will come like a prowler and your want like an armed man. Slothful service is talked about by Solomon there in Proverbs the devastating effect of slothful service can also be seen by uh, illustrating the church as a wagon uh, where uh, some help by pulling and some help by pushing uh, while others simply go along for the ride. And that makes a travel difficult for all involved because of the dead weight. If we're not pushing or if we're not pulling uh, and we're just going along for the ride, then we're uh, affecting all of those that are striving to work for um, the church. And thus we have the need for diligent, fervent service to the Lord. Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. Uh, And instead of sluggishness, we need to serve with faith and with patience. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, Many become slothful. Many become lazy. Many uh, quit their working because they don't have the patience to endure. And sometimes maybe we don't have the patience because we don't have the faith, and this goes back to what's been talked about previously, and that is having the Spirit uh, of God uh, through our time in the Word. But I would submit to you this evening that where slothful service is found, then you'll find the church the temple of God being defiled uh, or even being destroyed. So we need to be mindful. We need to be careful about the service that we render. Certainly there could be other ways to destroy uh, the temple of God, but I think these suffice suffice to make the point. Uh, But now we turn our, our thoughts to a second question, not just how does one Um, destroy the temple of God, but the second of the possibilities is that God will destroy those that destroy. So how will God destroy those who destroy the temple of God? Well, we have example in Scripture of those that are cut off. Jesus warned his disciples that they would be cut off if they did not bear fruit. John chapter 15 Uh, verses 1 and 2, and also verse 6. Are we bearing fruit, spiritual fruit? If not, we need to heed the warnings about being uh, cut off. Paul warned Christians that they would be cut off if they did not remain faithful. Romans chapter 11, verses 19 through 23. What does it mean to be faithful? We could... We could submit a lot of time into that thought, but but most of us realize what faithfulness is, and it's not just attendance. And in fact, it's far more uh, than attendance. I could be 
the most faithful to attend and still not be a faithful Christian. I still could be defiling uh, the temple of God. Jesus also warned Christians that he would vomit those out of his mouth who were lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3 verses 15 through 19. The church at Laodicea was lukewarm and it literally made God sick. It made Jesus sick. Their lukewarm warmness the fact that they were neither cold nor hot they were no doubt slothful in their service but certainly i think we could understand that the temple of god was being defiled by these lukewarm christians and they literally well it was figurative but in our literal way of thinking that makes god sick to not take uh, a stand and to stand up for that which is right and good in regard to his church. And destroyers of the temple of God will be cut off uh, before they can do too much damage. I think that's the point of these passages. We're not bearing fruit. You need to cut that off so that it will not damage the entire uh, body, the entire plant, as it were. This time of year, uh, ladies maybe more so than the gentlemen or what they call deadheading on their plants. They have to get rid of the blooms that have died. Why? So that the plant can flourish rather than be destroyed. So, God will destroy those who defile the temple, uh, first of all, by cutting them off. Secondly, I, I think we see in Scripture um, that he can destroy them by taking away their reward. And Jesus illustrated this in telling the parable of the talents uh, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 through uh, 29. Uh, they had something, but yet they were going to lose it if they didn't use it. The writer of Hebrews also warned his brethren uh, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1 and uh, verse 11 and also I believe back in Hebrews chapter 3 verses 17 through um, 19. And um, about the reward being taken uh, away. Destroyers of the temple of God will not receive the blessings intended uh, for them. They're going to be cut off. Uh, their reward will be taken away. Uh, and also, uh, God will destroy them uh, by assigning them to eternal punishment or eternal destruction. Peter wrote of those teaching destructive doctrines and what their end would be. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 and verse 9. Uh, Jesus also spoke the same of those who offend and practice lawlessness in Matthew chapter 13, verses 40 through 42, and how uh, they would receive eternal punishment. Uh, Christ also spoke of the lazy servant in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 30. This same eternal destruction for those who obey not the gospel referred to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9. So there is destruction for the destroyers of the temple of God. And they will be destroyed themselves. They'll be assigned to eternal destruction. Their reward will be taken away. They'll be cut off. As we close this evening, we need to consider that being in the temple of God is a wonderful blessing. Being part of the body and that's talked about in 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we've been in. It's a wonderful blessing to be part of the body of Christ. If we're in the temple of God, then the Spirit of God dwells in us. Here as we see in chapter 3 and verse 16. Being in the, the temple of God, uh, we have fellowship with God. Uh, and that foreshadows that which is to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 7. There's a real sense in which the temple of God cannot be destroyed. Luke chapter 1 and verse 33 tells us that the kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 tells us it's a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Yet in another sense, there's a very real danger of us contributing to the destruction of the temple of God. And we can do that in the impact that we have on others through our teaching and through our conduct and in the consequences of becoming unfaithful and slothful in our service. And thus we need to heed Paul's warnings here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. And we need to give serious consideration to our conduct in the holy temple of God. Let's pray together. Father, we're truly grateful for today. We're so thankful for the privilege that we have to study your word. We're thankful for the time that we've been able to be together this evening, and we pray that you would continue to bless us as we strive to do your will. Give us open eyes to the opportunities around us and help us to have open hearts to be receptive to the needs that we see of our fellow man. We're mindful of those that we love and care about that have an interest in our prayers. We pray for those that we love. We're so thankful for Jesus Christ, and we're thankful that for the hope that we have uh, through him. We pray for our nation. We pray for our president. We pray for our governor. We pray for our local leaders. We pray for all that are uh, interested in, in the good of our country, and we pray that all of us would be brought closer uh, to you and help us as Christians to let our light shine so that you could be glorified. And we offer this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this evening. We'll be together Sunday morning at 930 for our morning worship. We'll meet here at the building. If you're not able to meet with us at the building, that service will be live streamed. We also have a service here at the building on uh, Sunday evening at five o'clock and it's also live streamed. We invite you to be with us at those times or here on Wednesday night for our online uh, Bible study. Uh, stay safe and God bless. Sing the